What exactly? A crescendo is, you know, any line that has to come up on the end. A crescendo. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. Is that you, Spider-Man? <laughs> well, it's yes. to know. You can have it. Dragon Ball Z was another one that was just brutal, so don't mm. decide Dragon again. It's just a all that. I mean, it was just endless screaming! <laughs> several times in there too where suddenly the world will get very <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm okay now. Alright. The last part of your question. The voice actor's nightmare. Mm -hmm. That's when there's a job you really want. You've got the character. You have got it nailed. It's there. And you do an audition that is so pristine, so pure, so absolutely perfect. It can never be matched again. And the problem is, it can never be matched yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> take, take, a, take a minute. Actually, no, I did have some revenge because right. I was directing a uh, video game for a company called Interplay who ran themselves so badly they got bought by a French company. <laughs> and uh, it was one of those Dungeons and Dragons things, and I had a chance to hire Wally, and I brought Wally in, and we did an audition, and it was, it was like this little gnomish, ogreish thing, and he had this wonderful little raspy character with a lot of humor and everything, and we came in for the session. It was gone. We played it for him. Wally, why it's like this? No, no, Wally, bring it down, bring the humor. <laughs> <laughs> That's why guys like like uh, right. Scott and uh, and uh, Peter Cullen, Frank Welker, who's the, to be the king, the uh, god on earth, <laughs> are, are so so good at what they do because it's like, do you want to hear the reference tape from your audition? No, I think I remember. I mean, these guys are just bang. And I mean, I heard you the other day going into all your characters, and it's just like dropping into a room. So that I learned all that stuff from Sue Blue. Sue's great. Sue was my first director ever. Right? I adore Sue. I'm working Sue. with her right now, too, uh -huh. on a show called Dragon Booster. Uh -huh. And it, it, Sue, you know, she's going, grab a phrase. This is one of the little sort of tricks of the trade that Sue's so good at. She's like, you know, when you get a character, when you kind of lock it, just grab like a little secret first and it's just like a little signature phrase. Something, because I mean, God knows we get lost a lot. And especially if you're doing multiple voices, you know, and it's already in the series, you can kind of like, oh my God, what the, what do you sound like? And there's just, you know, like a little, you know, oh man, boom, right there. You know, so you kind of just play that in your little mental Rolodex and, and get yourself back in. Maurice LaMarche, every time he just, well, Maurice is great, just every every time before he records something, he does Orson Welles. Yeah. I've heard the Orson Welles outtake speech from him about a thousand times. That's his That's his ultimate warm-up for anything. Peas in July? So yeah, yeah, exactly. Peas, yes. Peas, perfect. Peas. Yes, next question. Uh, you already alluded to it a little bit earlier, but I was just wondering, um, in this industry, money is the almighty, you know, worshiper. Uh, with acquired animation, do you, in the industry, in, inside, see an end to that and more going back to kind of radio drama kind of thing? Or is acquired animation here to stay for a long, 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 long time? Long, long time. It's cheaper. Yeah, it's yes, cheaper. and actually it's getting worse because now the Japanese, and that's where most of the animation is coming from, have <laughs> discovered just what a market is here. <laughs> and so their license fees are going up, up, up. But the production budgets are staying the same or being reduced. There's a basic inequity here. Um, but there is still enough of a profit margin, and will continue to be that acquired animation is the wave of the broadcast future because you have this cable. How many channels do we have now? Don't count the satellite. You've got to feed that beast. Which it sells just as many toys. So. Yeah. But and it, and it makes shows like Transformers when we worked on them and, and the other ones you guys remember from when you were young that much more special think, to, to all of us. It's like, you know, you think about the golden age of animation, that kind of stuff. 
they're never going to do uh, they're never going to do it that way again. So it, it makes those memories, I think, all that more special. Here, here, that was my special moment. <laughs> Alright, originally I was going to say two questions, but I think Scott pretty much answered one of the two, which is, is it confusing sometimes to have doing multiple voices? Alright, the other question, which I'm directing towards Dan and Mike, and I specifically point you two out because you've been around literally since the beginning of Transformers for us. Are you both surprised that it's had this much influence and, for example, that you have an audience this huge just <laughs> waiting to talk to you right now? Endlessly astounded. Yeah, amazed. amazed. And uh, my appreciation knows no bounds. I, I, I keep saying this, and it's quite true. I mean, there's a Transformer, uh, Transformers universe, and if not up here, it's out there. You are it. And if it were not for you, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> Hello, I'm very glad to hear the uh, classic G1 characters uh, are, well, you guys are considering um, applying for the roles for the movie coming up, but Mr. McNeil, would you be considering applying for the role of Starscream? Just looking for my dad right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those situations, you know, I always have this great fear that it's going to be, well, we're going to get Rick Moranis to do it anyway, because, you know, it's, it's a name, but uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been replaced by him. What, I mean, that's one of those, like, oh my god, would I ever be honored moments. You know, it, those don't come along often in a lifetime. I mean, I, I very briefly stepped into Chris's shoes after he passed away, and I did a brief, very brief stint as Cobra Commander. So I know the pain of the voice. Um, I don't know, I mean, right now, it's my, my good friend Michael Dobson is doing Starscream for, for our, our Transformer thing. He's also, oddly enough, doing Cobra Commander for the new G.I. Joe stuff we're doing. So, I mean, you know, my right of passage, whatever, I mean, would I, if it was offered in a, in a New York minute, I would be, you know, those, like I said, those things don't come along, and those are the ones in your career where you kind of go, I just got to play Foghorn Leghorn for Warner Brothers, and I was like, oh my god, would I, you know, that's a man I consider to be Mel Blanc, I think, is, is the definitive voice actor. You know, he was so much more than just a guy who made voices. I mean, he made characters, which I think was what a good voice actor does. You know, he didn't create sounds, he created personas and personalities. So, you know, that's something that like, guys like you, guys like Maurice, guys like Tony, you know, they, 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 it's, 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 that's what makes them good. So, and yeah, what Chris did with it was such an amazing thing. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I grew up just going like, whoa, that is so cool. Cobra! Ow! <laughs> Dynamite was actually an offshoot of him. You know, I mean, still from the best. You know, that started off as when I did that, and then I went, well, but if I bring that down like two octaves, it becomes into a range where you can, you know, we can start to work in a bit. And it, so basically, I mean, if you spend your money, you end up with. So would I guess? Will I likely get it? That's great. So Remember, so camping out on Spielberg's front lawn. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll bring you, um, I assume for the news hit, um, hopefully all of agents out there um, pounding the streets, uh, knocking on doors. Oh yeah, agents work really hard. Yeah, they <laughs> well, especially, I mean, you know, internet, no, they don't use that. They go out, they knock on doors. <laughs> they're standing by. Let me, oh, yeah. let me just say that. They're, they're by their phones at this very moment. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> they also have to pay me Canadian money, which confuses people. So. That's, uh, That's bright colors. It's pretty. That's it's pretty. It's pretty money. It's pretty money. <laughs> I didn't bring any, I'm an idiot, usually I do. And Canadian cigarette packs are usually fun too, because they got pictures of like diseased lungs and rotten cases. <laughs> <laughs> they, they honestly do. Droopy cigarette. Yeah, I mean, the droopy cigarette is a good one. Cigarettes can cause impotence. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go again. Yes. Yes. Hi, um, I have a, uh, well first I'd like to thank you guys for coming out here. And when I hear your voices, it's like I can picture the characters in my mind, and for that, I'll always be grateful for that. And, um, for that, we're grateful. I'm loving listening to you right now. <laughs> Seriously, I love, you know, you hear those ones, you just go, oh my god, that's brilliant. <laughs> right. How can I steal it from him? <laughs> um, I have a question for Dan. Um, in, in season four of Transformers, when Bumblebee became Goldbug, did you have to make any uh, adjustments to his uh, voice or personality, or was he pretty much the same? Person. There was, they wanted a little bit more masculinity behind it, a little bit more take charge. I mean, Bumblebee was always a plucky little guy, 
but they want, I tried to add a little bit more maturity to the voice, I guess. It's all that gold, you know. If somebody blinks you, man, you're gonna, you're gonna think about it for a second. <laughs> wow. Um, so there was a tiny adjustment, not a lot, and I have to say that, that uh, and people have asked me this too, which do you prefer? The little yellow uh, Volkswagen is Bumblebee. Uh, I don't know, Goldbug, fine. I'd like to go back to Bumblebee again. I lived in Brisbane. Okay. When I was a very young lad. It was actually my father's in Aussie. And I was. Yeah, I'm just embarrassing myself now. <laughs> I was actually being in Canada and then I grew up in Australia until I was about like, three or four and then I came back and, and that was it. Okay. No, I'm from Perth. Hi. 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 There's a young woman yeah. here that I, I was talking to earlier who's got, I mean, she's got like the big, broad, sweeping. Wonderful, you know, has a guy in there, mate. Got a beautiful blurry accent. Uh, yes, I was wondering uh, if there were any of the characters from the Transformers series you weren't involved with that you would have liked to have done, and also if uh, they ever uh, do a commercial release of uh, the Japanese series, would you be involved? Would you be interested in being involved in voices for those? I think I'm already in voices yeah, for the Japanese series. We call it Armada and Energon. I was referring to the like uh, Master Force, Headmasters, and uh, Victory. I think it's one of those like work. They want to like us to work things. <laughs> yeah, I think what happened in the, I mean, the original series certainly, the, the, uh, you know, it's toy based. So the more toys they came up with, the better for Hasbro. So they were constantly coming up with new designs, and that meant new voice actors, and that meant phasing out some of the older ones. And I would have loved to have gone on. Um, to, you know, to continue the character throughout, you know, some more of its incarnations, but that wasn't Hasbro's idea of, uh, of good marketing. The toys not selling lose the yeah, kid. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Hello, my question is for Dan Gillison. Uh, putting in, uh, putting aside the name Bumblebee, what was your initial reaction to your character being a more kid-friendly character rather than the more uh, warrior-like Autobot? And uh, how do you feel about Bumblebee being uh, perhaps the second most uh, fondly remembered Autobot after Optimus Prime? I'm honored, uh, for one. Honored and very pleased. Um, I, and I think part of the reason for that is, is exactly what you put your finger on. He was the smallest, and he had a lot to prove. Most of you guys were watching it when you were little. And when you're little, you've got a lot to prove. And I think people, uh, so the kids looked to Bumblebee, and certainly and also his, his relationship with Spike. Spike sort of represented the audience as well. So he's bonded with Spike, which basically he's bonded with you. So I think those two things um, combined to make him popular, and I'm, I'm just really grateful I was cast as, uh, as Bumblebee and not as, uh, I don't know, what, what's a more obscure character that nobody even remembers? Yeah. Yeah, see, there's a lot of them. Yeah. There's a lot of them. So I, I, I'm really fortunate that that, that happened, and I'm, and I'm, you know, glad to be here to, to see all you guys too. And let me just add, I I'm going over some of the questions. Oh, are there any questions? Do you, you want to present them? No, I can't conceive a bumblebee with any other voice. Gillianthal is being, or Gillianthal is being contacted uh, for the role, since uh, Toby's got Spider-Man going, so, you know. <laughs> we'll see. Hello there. Um, a lot of, sort of, scene actors, you know, when they're doing interviews, have got a sort of definitive role that they enjoy playing more than anything else they've ever had. Have any of the three of you found that character yet, whether it's in Transformers or outside of that? And also, do any of you find that you're typecasting the people come to you because they like what you've done in, you know, yourself with your waspinator and the googly eyed guy out of um, Do you find that they want that from you, so therefore they come to you and they're not wanting you to express yourself in the way that the character movie should be? I just want to hear you ask that whole question. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you from? Scotland. Yeah, but which dub? Like what part? <laughs> well, actually, so far I've been 
been Swiss, Australian, and Austrian, so really, no, it's not necessarily that obvious, but Edinburgh. Ah. It's it's beautiful beautiful it's the beautiful yeah. glossal like, yeah. boom, stops. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah, let's answer the question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, you want to start? Um, Michael, you start. Oh, fine, thanks. Okay. Um, <laughs> actually, the, the characters which turn out to be the most fun to do for me tend to be really insane. <laughs> uh, but there's a series called Big O, an anime series. I have here. Oh, a guy named Schwarzwald. And he's really just sort of a commentator on the human condition. As you can see from his mummy wrapped head and his wild, maniacal laughter and uh, his uh, observations as the city plunges into chaos. Now that's entertainment. <laughs> that's fine. Um, I don't love him like I love tracks, but I like doing it. <laughs> you want a chance to rephrase that? <laughs> I stand behind my words. Yes, I am. So you just stand behind the character. Then you know you stand behind me. All right. We're children present. And, and Scott's very, very, uh, you know, he's, he's very impressionable. <laughs> I heard some words the other day. Yes, but we'll discuss that later, Scotty. Um, I have great fun, of course, for Bumblebee, but I have to tell you my, my absolute all-time favorite is Spider-Man. Uh, I was a, a big Spider-Man fan as a kid. I mean, I had the comic. I remember riding my bike when I was like 13 or 14 up to the corner of Rexall Drugstore to get the latest uh, issue of Spider-Man. So when I was cast in that, it was like, you know, like you said, what a what an honor and what a and what a weight on my shoulders. I was just completely freaked out. It was also my first job in animation. I'd never done it before. Yeah, it was really frightening. Um, and thankfully, and one of the reasons I rate Frank Welker so high is Frank stood beside me doing Iceman, and I learned a lot just from standing next to Frank. So my favorite would have to be Spider-Man. Um, now you have to tell me. Oh God, you're all my, they're all my children. I love them all equally. <laughs> there's, there's. I mean, I get asked this a lot of conventions, and I go to, you know, ones that are in just transformer conventions and whatnot. There's, uh, the weird ones are the most fun. You know, I've done stuff like, I don't know if you remember, Bucky O'Hare and the Toad Wars we did years ago. I was definitely down uh, on that. That was cool, because I thought it was a neat series. You know, I like, I really enjoyed the series. Um, if y'all remember, uh, how long have I been down here? I've said the term y'all about four times. <laughs> so, uh, so there I was up in Canada. Um, and watch, uh, there was a show we did called The Wacky World of Tex Avery. Um, if, if, if you so happen to see it, there was a there was a sequence set up that was involved Freddy the Fly and and Amanda Banshee, this old spinster woman, and I got to be Amanda Banshee, the old spinster woman. And that, uh, it's one of the joys of animation, right? It sort of touches on what somebody was saying about typecasting. There is none, at least you know it's sort of in my my little part of my fractured universe. It's what's so wonderful about it is it's absolutely free. You know, there's nothing you cannot play if you can if you can make it sound right and bring that character to life. So it's it's a gas. I've um, you know, Dill Maxwell from from Gundam was fun just because you know it's like that's how cool I wish I had been when I was 15. <laughs> you know, all the DBZ stuff was great. But even at anime conventions, when I get asked that, I always end up coming back to going the, the absolute best show I've ever had the chance to work on. You know, and there's been some good ones and some bad ones, but it was was Beast Wars. And again, it was and I really attribute that again to the writing, to what Bob and Larry did with the storylines. You know, and being able to play four four characters that were so different, and sort of you know allow them to grow, and, and it, you know it was a fun, and it just I think it was a good show. You know, I haven't done anything since anyway. And you know, as far as absolute number one favorite. You know, I mean, Waspinator was fun, and Rat Trap was a gas, and I loved doing Silver Bolt, but I think Dinobot was the single best written character, the single best. Yeah. Shakespeare in a cartoon. <laughs> um, as fun as it would be to sit in Shakespeare's front lawn, the Shakespeare's. <laughs> 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 That's Scott. Um, anyway, there's a... Uh, 
since uh, we're a good power base and you guys would be the other good power base is uh, donmurphy.net. He's got a message board and you can register and put your stuff up on there and all that. Because uh, I'm, I guess, good friends with Vince and I tried to get uh, Don to get a noticeable thing for Vince doing music because that's Vince has got music. music. Yeah. That's yeah. just How many of you were here last night to hear Vince? <laughs> enough money to buy to buy Vince an orchestra. Yeah, he needs, he needs a band. Though. That's all he needs is a full symphony orchestra. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering, since you said you were uh, supposed to do Spike, could you do what you were, what Spike would have been? Oh gosh, uh, Spike would have been 20 years younger. At that. <laughs> uh, no, I can barely do Bumblebee anymore. <laughs> but uh, well, Sp that's the problem. See, Sp I don't have the kind of range that our friend Scott does. In fact, one of the questions was asked, Are you, do you mind being pigeonholed? And I, I have been and was kind of as the young hero, because that was kind of my, my thing. I did Spider-Man and a lot of the young hero, uh, uh, Dargon and, uh, from Sectars and a lot of shows that never made it. Uh, Spiral Zone, we did 65 episodes of that. It was kind of obscure. Uh, so I did a lot of those. I think if, if you're going to be pigeonholed, Find a nice big pigeonhole, you know, a really big one. Big bird. Yeah, exactly. So uh, and that's just flashing back to that. So. Uh, and since we always hear about stories about Frank Walker and how he does the fly around the room, the telephone, can you tell us some other stories we haven't heard? Ah, uh, yes, children. Well, <clears throat> when I was a boy, <laughs> we did a show called. Well, it was complete chaos in that recording booth. And, and Michael will tell you, Michael will verify this. I mean, there are, were so many characters at one point, they had to devise a system of uh, an intercom system where the people who were not involved in the, in the scene that was being recorded at that time would wait in the outer lobby and wait for their names to be called because there were so many freaking people in that 20 by, by uh, what, maybe 20 by 10 recording booth? 20 by 12. 20 by 12. So you've got guys like Welker, you've got Michael Bell, who's, who's just, he's just a maniac. <laughs> he's nuts, he's always doing stuff. He's like lighting your script on fire and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, fun stuff. Uh, you know, Frank is doing the fly, and they're looking, and, and Peter Cullen's <laughs> Peter, Peter's a great audience, because he's got that <laughs> He's amused, when he's amused, you can tell. Um, there was so much going on in there. Michael, do you have any, like, specific? No, no, I've already done mine. I've done, this is your chance. No, all right, fine. I, did it fine. I, will, I will share uh, Chris Lotta, uh, a little Chris Lotta tribute with you. Um, Chris was, was absolutely amazing with, with his voices. And I, was, I listened to a couple of episodes uh, a couple of weeks ago, as I said, off the DVD, and I was, I was just amazed at, at Starscream. What a great character that was. I mean, just absolutely toadying and, and trying to get the power and just. What a disgusting vehicle it was. It was just great. Uh, Chris was not like that at all. Chris was a sweet man. Chris, however, perspired f uh, freely. <laughs> I used to pray that I would not be placed next to Chris because after a recording session, my, the whole side of my body would be wet. Him doing his stuff and flailing about. And uh, Chris put everything he had into it. So that, that's my lot of story, is that I, I'm sorry it has to do with bodily fluids, but... Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, basically they do, don't they? So uh, that's, that's my Chris Lotta remembrance. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, got a few, we'll start off with this one. Scott, what is it with you and Rick Moranis? What is the story? Oh, you? you know what? Uh, <laughs> what is it? They show came to my house one day, I said, no. I did a couple of things where, I don't know, I just, I've done a couple of like Christmas specials and stuff where it came out on the rack and you're suddenly going, oh, wait a minute. But that was in the, oh yeah, sorry, they yeah, decided to use, and it just did happen once with Rick Moranis, so I just used his name. I have nothing against him. <laughs> <laughs> it's that Eric Idle bastard.